If you've ever tried playing Halo 2 on Legendary difficulty, you know that it's one of gaming's most brutal challenges. It goes way beyond the hardest setting of most games. Enemies are stronger, they're more plentiful, and they kill you almost instantly. Beating Halo 2 on Legendary is a serious achievement. But one group of gamers takes it a step further. They strive to beat Halo 2 Legendary as fast as physically possible. And through thousands of collective hours from the game's best players, they've taken the record to unimaginable levels. This is the history of Halo 2 World Records. And now a word from this video's sponsor, Xbox Game Pass. Valheim is now available to play on Xbox with Game Pass, and to celebrate, they're hosting a new speedrun competition. And you can participate right now! Here are the rules. The goal is to kill a troll as fast as possible. Timing starts when the character takes their first step, and ends on the frame the troll dies. It must be on a new game with a new viking using the World Seed Game Pass, and it must be a solo run. All exploits and glitches are banned. The fastest three submissions will receive special rewards blessed by Odin himself, one of three custom controllers. To participate, upload a video of your run to YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The title must include hashtag Game Pass Valheim Speedrun, and the video must be from your Xbox. The deadline is 5.59pm Pacific Time on May 27th. See if you can enshrine yourself in speedrunning history. Best of luck! Game Pass has hundreds of high-quality games like Valheim available on release day. Discover your next favorite game with Xbox Game Pass. Halo 2 has had a thriving speedrun scene ever since its release in 2004. Players competed on both individual levels and the full game on each of the four difficulty modes. While all these records were lowered over time, the most prestigious one was the full game Legendary speedrun, thanks to its incredible difficulty. Halo 2 Legendary was featured at GDQ events, and videos were shared all over the internet. It was a very popular speedrun. But the actual record timeline is another story. From 2004 through 2014, Halo 2's legendary world record was near continuously held by one player, Mr. Monopoly. Monopoly became synonymous with Halo speedruns, holding records and playing the game at live events. But the timeline of the world record itself isn't all that interesting. Monopoly got the Halo 2 record in 2006 and remained dominant for the next eight years. However, in June 2014, the Halo community got a big surprise. 343 Industries announced Halo The Master Chief Collection, a compilation of all the mainline Halo games. And to celebrate Halo 2's 10th anniversary, 343 was going to remaster it as Halo 2 Anniversary, with graphical upgrades and a few other changes. And it just so happens that members of their development team were speedrun fans. Big enough fans that they flew out Goat Rope and Monopoly, top speedrunners of the first two Halo games, to help playtest the games a few months before their release. They spent about 20 hours playtesting, then sat down with 343's franchise writer to name achievements after top Halo speedrunners. And fittingly, the achievement for beating Halo 2 Legendary quickly enough? Monopolized. It's clear that from the get-go, 343 Industries designed Halo The Master Chief Collection with speedrunning in mind. While most of the games included were essentially identical to their original release, Halo 2 Anniversary was sufficiently different that it became its own speedrun category. So, right at the game's release in November 2014, 
players began running Halo 2 Anniversary. Monopoly and a runner named HockeyFan48 traded the legendary record back and forth in the first few days. But the first run we're going to look at came a few weeks later. Halo 2 Legendary, completed in 2 hours and 17 minutes by none other than Mr. Monopoly. First off, Monopoly went into this run expecting to die. A lot. It's just not realistic to have a deathless playthrough of Halo 2 on Legendary, unless you're going slowly and being extremely careful. Fortunately, there are checkpoints throughout each level, so when you die, you can quickly enter the menu and revert to the last checkpoint. But Monopoly didn't have to worry about dying too much in the first level, the Armory, which is essentially a two and a half minute cutscene that serves as a tutorial. Given the length of the run, we won't talk about every level in depth right now, but Cairo Station is the first real level, and Monopoly did his best to move quickly and ignore as many enemies as possible. When he had to fight them, he tried to clear out the elites quickly with an overcharged plasma pistol shot, then a headshot from the battle rifle. He also strafed to try and avoid being shot, but still had to take cover at times, and was careful to avoid being too aggressive. Next up was Outskirts, which has a famous intended trick from the developers. By doing a series of grenade jumps, where you throw a grenade and time a jump to get a boost upwards, you can get on top of the buildings and make it out of bounds. This lets you skip fighting a long wave of enemies on the ground. The second half of the stage involves a lot of driving, and Monopoly switched to the Warthog since the Marines soak up a lot of the damage and let you live longer. Eventually, Monopoly arrived at the Oracle. This is one of the longest levels in the run, with wave after wave of enemies to fight through. But he had tricks to help. On the elevator, you're normally supposed to slowly ride it all the way down. But if you wait for a death box to despawn, you can fall off the edge and land on the precise spot you need to continue the level. The rest of the level was a lot of clearing out enemies, and five deaths to go along with it. Delta Halo is one of the most broken levels in the game. He started by jumping on the hillside to get on top, then hitting a trigger that allowed him to progress and continue on top of the hill. He then got in a ghost, and was supposed to activate a bridge to get across this gap. But instead, he did this. It turns out, a grenade is strong enough to boost vehicles as well, and Monopoly was able to save half a minute. The next level is called Regret, and it features one of the biggest tricks in the run, Early Gondola. The intended route at the start is to work your way around the structures and platforms, then land on the middle platform, which acts as a trigger to send the gondola away. You can't ride it yet. After killing all the enemies, another gondola begins to come toward you, and once it arrives, you can hop on and ride it to progress through the level. It'd save a lot of time if you could just ride on that initial gondola that goes away, but as soon as you get near it, it's gone. That's where Early Gondola comes into play. Monopoly used a careful jumping route to go straight to the gondola, including a slide jump, where you use the extra momentum from a slide to extend your jump across a gap. He then left the gondola to hit the edge of the trigger on the middle platform, then quickly got back on the gondola just before it pulled away. He had to avoid dying on the way from the enemies that spawned, but once he was in the clear, he had saved two and a half minutes by not having to wait for the second gondola. Now, he did die six times throughout the level, but using early gondola at the start was able to make up for most of that. A few levels later came Gravemind, the longest and most notorious level in the run. To get an idea of what I mean, this is how the level begins on Legendary. Wow. And to clarify, Monopoly knew this was coming. Even so, he struggled to take cover in time. And it's a good representation of the rest of the level. 
there are enemies everywhere, and Monopoly had to strike a balance between keeping moving and trying to stay alive. Gravemind ended up taking him over 26 minutes, and he died 34 times. He did have some tricks to help out, like jumping into a sloped rock so he could go out of bounds and walk above long hallways. This helped him avoid fighting certain enemies. Monopoly also used a trick called Corridor Deload. During reinforcement battles, he stood in precise spots between waves to fool the game into thinking he was out of bounds, so the enemies didn't detect him and never spawned in. But even with tricks like this to help, he was overmatched. He died all throughout Gravemind. But eventually, he did make it through. After a couple shorter levels in Uprising and High Charity, Monopoly arrived at the Great Journey, Halo 2's final level. He was able to despawn the Wraiths by simply driving away from them and hitting a checkpoint, and then went inside with the Ghost. He died several times while trying to navigate through, then got in the Banshee to wait and enter the final section of the level. Once inside, he took out the enemies, took out the final boss, and the run was complete. Monopoly died 66 times throughout the game's 14 levels, with more than half of those coming in Gravemind alone. That's Halo 2 on Legendary for you. But to be fair, Monopoly was at a disadvantage. He was the Halo 2 Classic record holder, and this was Halo 2 Anniversary. That meant adjusting to slightly different physics, tricks, and enemy behavior. Monopoly is one of the best to ever play Halo 2, but 66 deaths obviously wasn't the end goal. However, he left the Halo 2 anniversary record up for grabs, as after this run, he went back to playing Halo 2 Classic. In fact, that's what most of the community did. Despite Halo 2 Classic having a history dominated by Monopoly, it remained the more popular speedrun. And there's a specific reason why. See, when 343 remastered Halo 2, they based it off of a patched version of the game. As a result, many glitches from the original game weren't present. It may have seemed like a good move at the time, but for speedrunners, these glitches were used all over the place. So, since Halo 2 Anniversary couldn't be optimized like Classic could, many runners simply ignored it. That being said, it wasn't completely abandoned. A community of runners still played Halo 2 Anniversary, trying to better optimize the run with fewer deaths and faster movements. Numerous world records were set, and the time came down quickly. But sadly, from 2015 through 2017, nearly no legendary world record videos survive. It's hard to say why people didn't save their times, especially ones that were world records. Twitch automatically saved them as past broadcasts for a while, but those eventually were deleted, and no records were ever highlighted or uploaded to YouTube. Although we can't watch these runs today, we do thankfully know what the timeline was. Here's what survives of the early Halo 2 anniversary record history. In early 2015, speedrunner Kryphon set a series of world records, ultimately taking the time to 2.03.58. Kryphon was a former competitive Halo player, and got into Halo 2 speedruns after seeing the speedrunning achievements that 343 added. He spent a few months playing Halo 2 Anniversary, lowered the record, then moved on to playing Halo 2 Classic. A few months later, Andy's Mountain came along. He got into running the game the same way Kryphon did, seeing the speedrun achievements and trying it out himself. And throughout June 2015, he took the record from 2.03 to 2 hours flat. Finally, a few months later, Nazar23 took the top spot. He was big into speedrunning individual levels, especially Regret setting numerous records there for Halo 2 Anniversary. He didn't have much interest in running the full game, but eventually, he was persuaded to try it. 
and Nazar23 wound up getting the first sub 2 hour run in the game's history, later lowering the time to 1.56. Late in 2016, a pretty big change was made. The community voted to subtract loads from the final time, since they could vary slightly from runner to runner. That took about 6 minutes off of all runs, meaning the world record was now re-timed as a 1.50. And about a year after this change, one final record was set, a 1.49 from speedrunner Gervalin, who'd been running the game for a few months and saw his chance to take the top spot. So, this is Halo 2 Anniversary's early timeline. An irregular progression, with bursts of activity followed by months of silence. It's unfortunate that no videos survived, but at least the history is preserved. But finally, in April 2018, Gervalin came in clutch. He set a new world record and saved the video. This is the first time we can watch a Halo 2 anniversary record in over three years. We last saw the record at 2.17. Now, it's down to 1.46. This is gonna look pretty different. Well, right from the get-go, he was more aggressive. All throughout the run, Gervalin attacked enemies more directly instead of hanging back. In Cairo alone, the first real level, this saved him 45 seconds. While playing more aggressively can be faster, you do run the risk of dying more. But Gervalin improved in that department too. He saved nearly 3 minutes over the following 3 levels by reducing the amount of deaths. Another major area of improvement was new strategies. Many of these have been slowly implemented over the last 3.5 years, but this is the first time we can see them in a run. And some are pretty huge. In Oracle, Gervalin sent the elevator up, then got underneath it and sent it back down. The result was him being launched into the air, shooting through the elevator shaft to the top rather than having to ride it. This saves 10 seconds on its own, but also has an important side effect. The game makes you invincible in the elevator shaft, and since the elevator never reaches the top, the trigger to take your invincibility away is never hit. So, you're invincible for the remainder of the level. This trick is called the Pressure Launch, and was found by none other than Mr. Monopoly. Delta Halo was also drastically changed. The level has five triggers that must be hit, and Gervalin was able to hit them, then work his way out of bounds to take shortcuts. As long as he activated all the triggers, he was able to scale mountains and cut corners all day. He did this more than Monopoly did, and was able to skip fighting many enemies. But the biggest strategy overhaul came in Halo 2's final level, The Great Journey. You need to get the Spectre inside the final room. Normally, that's not possible, since the Spectre travels on the ground and the door to enter is high in the sky. But by parking it in a safe space earlier in the level, then hopping back in later and riding along the right side ridge, you can stop on top and wait for the scarab to break open the door. The ending trigger extends out of the building, so you can precisely let the specter drop down and fall into the cutscene. If done properly, the specter will survive and make it inside. And once there, you can perform one of Halo 2's finest tricks, Johnson cloning. Johnson, one of the AI marines, is able to repeatedly lower the final boss's shield so you can inflict damage. Johnson only shoots the boss so often, limiting your abilities to damage him. So let's find a way to create more Johnsons. By forcing Johnson to get in the Spectre, the game detects he's not in the level and spawns another one. By forcing that Johnson to get in, the process repeats and you can create infinite Johnsons, although each additional one costs more time. Eventually, the game spawns one final Johnson, and you take the other three Johnsons to the middle platform in the Spectre. All four Johnsons attack the boss, his shields are lowered more often, and the fight is complete in a fraction of the time. 
thanks to Johnson cloning and other tricks across the run, Gervalin had a massive leg up on Monopoly. But the biggest difference wasn't new strategies. It was the amount of deaths. Monopoly died 66 times in his run. How many deaths did Gervalin have? Nine. Gervalin's 146 didn't last on top too long. Even though much of the community was focused on Halo 2 Classic, there was still one top runner who kept his attention on the remake. His name was By Nails, and almost immediately, he began setting records in Halo 2 Anniversary. That May, he beat Gervalin's run by about three minutes. There wasn't much in the way of new strategies, but there's a couple levels in particular where he saved big time. Quarantine Zone, the level directly before Gravemind, can be a major run killer. The final five minutes are essentially an auto-scroller, but the first section involves doing some extremely careful driving. You have to go from room to room, dodging enemies as much as possible and hoping you don't get sniped. Deaths can be very costly depending on your last checkpoint, and although Gervalin died once, Nails was able to drive faster and avoid dying, so he saved a full minute. Now, on average, Nails did die more across the run. 11 deaths versus Gervalin's 9. But his deaths were less costly, and he played faster elsewhere. In Oracle, he had small time saves while in combat that added up to roughly half a minute. And in Gravemind, despite dying 5 times, he actually gained time over Gervalin. It's an important lesson in Halo 2 speedrunning. Deaths can be costly, yes, but if you're aggressive enough with your play, the time save from being faster can outweigh a few extra deaths. Nails had a great run, but as mentioned earlier, the community's attention was elsewhere. Without the glitches that Halo 2 Classic had, most runners just viewed Halo 2 Anniversary as a sideshow. Despite some solid recent records from Gervalin and Nails, top runners put most of their efforts into the original game. That's the way it had been for years, and it showed no signs of stopping. But then, in August 2018, 343 Industries made an announcement that changed everything. Just shy of four years after the game's release, 343 modified Halo 2 Anniversary's mechanics. There were a handful of minor changes, but the most relevant one for speedrunners? They added glitches from Halo 2 Classic back into the game. It's time to introduce you to Sword Tech. When Halo 2 Classic was released in 2004, it had one particularly game-breaking glitch. You lock onto an enemy with a weapon, then switch to the energy sword, and cancel the animation of the switch by reloading right as it starts. This creates a two-frame window where the energy sword turns into a long-range weapon and can lock onto that same faraway enemy. If you lunge in that tiny window, you'll go flying across the map. This can be done throughout the run, and variations can save even more time. You can jump while flying to get more air, and soar past nearby enemies by adding in a jump and action input. Bungie patched Sword Tech out of Halo 2 in 2005, and when 343 remastered the game, they followed suit. But in 2018, with most of the speedrun community ignoring Halo 2 Anniversary, Sword Tech was reintroduced, a rare instance of developers adding glitches intentionally. And it worked. Speedrunners began paying attention to Halo 2 Anniversary. Within months, it would surpass the popularity of Halo 2 Classic. But right away, it was clear that the world record would be shattered. Sword Tech saves several minutes across the run. You not only gain time by flying through the air, but also reduce your odds of dying by skipping over enemies on the ground. 
The record wasn't going to remain at 143 for long. And in October 2018, the first world record with sword tech was set. 137.25 by Kryphon. Kryphon did sword flying all over the run. A couple big ones were in Cairo, skipping having to traverse the outside sections. There were a few smaller ones in Arbiter and Oracle, but the most significant one came in Regret. Instead of having to slowly ride on the first gondola, Kryphon got a bit over halfway through, locked onto a faraway enemy, and took off. There were a handful of other significant sword flies later, particularly in Gravemind. But sword tech wasn't the only change made in the patch. 343 made slight modifications to the entire physics engine, making it more in line with Halo 2 Classic. So, one other broken mechanic was inadvertently added back in. Butterflying. By getting an enemy in position right above you, you can melee and then cancel to preserve your momentum and travel around through the air. This is used in two major places. In Gravemind, you're supposed to go down the elevator to play the prison section, then go back up and resume the rest of the level. But instead, by luring an enemy over and falling with him on top of you, you can butterfly back upwards by repeatedly melee cancelling to activate the elevator that takes you back up. The game thinks the prison section is complete, and you save 3-4 to four minutes by not even having to go down there. Prison Skip was found by Mr. Monopoly in 2016, but couldn't be applied to Halo 2 Anniversary until now. This works! I did it! I skipped Gravemind Prison! This is Gravemind Prison Skip! The other trick is in High Charity, Halo 2's second to last level. The ending portion of High Charity is actually right below where you begin. So if you lure an enemy over and begin butterflying off the edge, you can time your melee so that you have a controlled descent down to the ending. You also have to navigate to the side at times, and it can be quite tricky. But if done properly, you'll skip playing the level and save close to 3 minutes. The trigger for High Charity Skip was found by a player named Nibre, while several others made the trick a reality. The modern setup was found by Monopoly. With Sword Flies, Prison Skip, and High Charity Skip all added in, Kryphon had the potential to save over 10 minutes. But his run was only a 6 minute improvement. He died 19 times, and most sections of the run were slower outside of the new strategies. It was an unoptimized time, understandable given that it was the first world record after the patch. With Sword Tech being possible, the community was more excited about Halo 2 Anniversary than ever before. The strategies had been found. Now, they had to optimize the record. Over the following few months, Nails took the time down to 1 hour and 32 minutes. Nails had turned into an absolute monster since his last record, and to this day he's considered to be the greatest Halo speedrunner of all time. He's gotten top times in every main game and has held the record in several. Back in late 2018, he was focused on Halo 2 Anniversary, and took 5 minutes off the record, starting with a 135 and then getting a 132. Nails didn't do much different from Kryphon, but he did die less, 13 times versus Kryphon's 19. Was that really enough for such a large record improvement? Well, 5 minutes might seem like a pretty big difference, but that's because of the nature of Halo 2 Legendary. It's an incredibly difficult speedrun to optimize. There's too many places to die, and it's inevitable that things will go wrong. Since deaths cost roughly 30 seconds on average, it's easy to see why there was so much room for time save. Just 5 days after Nails is 132, Another 3 minutes came off the record. A runner named Rokats got the first sub-130 in the game's history. Rokats got into the game in 2016, but like so many others, he returned once sword flying was patched back in. 
He grinded for a few months in late 2018, and in January 2019, he got a 129.55 with only 8 deaths. Most of his time save came early, and the only death in the first half was a nearly unavoidable snipe in Metro. He bled time in Gravemind due to 6 deaths, but played Great Journey much more aggressively. He did sword tech faster and stopped to kill fewer enemies. The record was in a good spot, being under 130. But despite the progress, there was still room for improvement. Tricks could be cleaner and combat could be smoother. So, Rokats continued to play. And over the following several months, this is what he did. By early 2021, the time was down to 126.34. A decent chunk of time save came from the Regret boss fight, where he had an extremely clean kill in his 126.39. You have to board him 5 times and reach a damage threshold each time. He can spawn in 8 different locations after each cycle, and if he spawns far away and you get unlucky with other enemy spawns, you can die very easily. But in this run, Rokats had an extremely quick fight, with no deaths and close spawns from the boss. For years, Halo 2 Classic had dwarfed Halo 2 Anniversary in popularity. But how the turntables? Thanks to the patch, Halo 2 Anniversary had surpassed Halo 2 Classic. As expected, competition at the top started to increase. A player named Firebanch became the second runner to cut 130 in early 2021. But Rokats ultimately prevailed, getting a 124 in August 2021 with a faster boss kill in Great Journey. By September, Rokats had held the record for close to 3 years straight and showed no signs of giving it up. But then, the Halo 2 community voted to make an interesting rule change. As mentioned before, Halo 2 starts with a level called the Armory, which is basically a 2.5 minute cutscene. There's no enemies, and time saves are extremely minimal. It's pretty frustrating to have to begin every speedrun attempt with this level. So, in September 2021, the community set up a vote to determine if it could just be skipped, and all speedruns could start on level 2, Cairo. Many old school runners were against removing Armory, and remain against it to this day. But in the end, the community chose to remove it, and all Halo 2 runs could now start from Cairo. This changed a lot. For one thing, all runs were now 2.5 minutes faster, so the world record was retimed as a 122. But it also changed how runs were done going forward you could get a good run going much more easily, as you didn't have to replay Armory every time you wanted to start over. Cairo could be better optimized, and ultimately, the entire run could be too. Removing Armory was certainly a controversial decision, but it brought a new wave of popularity to the speedrun. A couple months after the rule change, Kryphon got a great run going. He hadn't held the record in over 3 years, but he was going to have a chance at this. He saved a big chunk early in Cairo and never looked back, slowly gaining time over the following levels. The important sword flies in Regret went well, as did the boss fight. And after a gold split on Sacred Icon, he was nearly 2 minutes ahead and on pace for a 123. He entered Quarantine Zone, 5 levels from the end. But then... A couple untimely deaths, and some slow navigating, meant Kryphon's lead nearly entirely vanished. His world record chance was gone, but he still got a nice personal best out of it. But Rokats had better look out. With Armory being removed from timing, 
other runners were more determined than ever to get the world record. In particular, there were three of them. Cryfin was in second place, and we've seen how much potential he had. He'd been dominating Halo 2 Classic for years, and with a better quarantine zone, he would have had the Halo 2 anniversary record as well. In third place was a runner named Sinister. He'd been running the game for a couple years, slowly lowering himself into world record contention. And while he was still 5 minutes behind the record, he had the potential to get it with a really strong run. And finally, there was Zoo. He was originally a Halo 3 runner, but later started focusing on Halo 2 Anniversary with Kryphon as his mentor. He was the farthest from the record, with his main goal being to beat Kryphon and get second place. But Zoo had one advantage over his competitors, thanks to a trick he went for right as the speedrun begins. Tram Skip. At the start of Cairo, there's a tram that leaves behind you. It passes by a later section of the level, so if you can just go where the tram's headed, you can skip the first part of Cairo. Problem is, there's an invisible barrier that pushes you back, and it doesn't disappear until after a door closes that you also can't pass through. If you try to approach the barrier, you'll get pushed back through the open door. There's no way to make it through. Well, in 2019, Nails found a way around this, and in 2020, Monopoly improved upon it with an easier method. You start by shooting your teammates until just before they turn and aggro to you. You then push a marine into the corner of the tram, and as he rides away, you follow him. By spamming melee, he'll become an enemy and you can cling to him as the tram passes through the door. Once the barrier disappears, you're free to move forward through the rest of the level. This saves 45 seconds as you don't have to play the start of Cairo, but it comes with a catch. Your teammates will try to kill you for the remainder of the level. This isn't too problematic on easy mode, but on legendary your teammates kill you fast. So, despite being discovered years earlier, it wasn't used in full game runs. Until Zoo came along. He had a lot of runs die early, but he had a 45 second advantage by going for it. So, in short, all three of these runners had a chance to get the record. Let the competition begin. Well, in May 2022, Zoo struck first, getting a 124-29. With just one personal best, he had nearly accomplished his goal of beating Kryphon. The run wasn't on record pace for too long, but this was still a remarkable time. Zoo was starting to make a name for himself in Halo 2. At this point, when I had the 124, I wasn't really looking to get record at the time. My main goal at that point was just to bop Gryphon, like a student becomes a teacher type of thing. When he ended up getting the 124, I think his goal was to just bop me at the time, like you mentioned. I, I probably told him that he can get whatever time he wants and the torch is his to take. With this run, it was now clear. Zoo was the odds-on favorite to get the record. Despite taking a break to play more Halo 3, where he set that legendary world record, Zoo quickly came back to Halo 2, and on May 28th, he was able to get on an excellent run. He pulled further and further ahead. After Quarantine Zone, he was minutes ahead of his personal best, but he still had to get through Gravemind. Like, Gravemind is like the main run killer, you know, like everyone just fears Gravemind. I had like a 920 Gravemind, which is pretty good for a full game legendary run. So after I finished that, I was like, I was getting nervous, I was kind of getting shaky. This run actually had a shot to get record. When they enter the last level, it's exciting. Like, at least as a longtime runner of the game, like your heartbeat gets way up there with them because you know just how much pressure they have on themselves and just how much pressure there is to perform. But unfortunately, he couldn't lock it down this time. He ended with a 122.37, just 17 seconds behind the world record. You know, I missed record by 17 seconds at the time, but I also, I was really excited to 
get a PB that close to record. I was pretty happy with it. I was pretty motivated by it to kind of keep going. So, Zoo continued onward. He didn't play for a few weeks thanks to Moist Critical's Deathless Lasso challenge, but afterwards he got back to it. And on August 7th, he was on another remarkable pace, gaining time in level after level. After Sacred Icon, his lead was nearly a full minute, way ahead of world record pace. But unfortunately, Quarantine Zone did not go well, and an untimely death in Gravemind was the nail in the coffin. I mean, as a longtime Halo 2 runner, that's like classic Halo 2 legendary speedrunning. You will lose every single run, or at least a majority of them, to Quarantine Zone through Great Journey. This was now two huge record chances that he'd missed. He was starting to let it slip away. And right on cue, Cryphon and Sinister started to close in. Just three days apart, they set new personal bests of a low 124 and a low 125. I saw, hey, I still have what it takes, I guess, you know? And I might have a shot at it. I was still like, kind of motivated to grind it, but yeah, I was like losing hope a little bit. A couple more weeks passed, with nothing from Zoo. But finally, he was able to get on another good run. He started with Tram Skip, then kept it close over the following levels. Oracle and Regret were both solid, and he ended up with a gold split on Sacred Icon. Things were looking pretty good. He was getting into Gravemind at a pretty good time, actually. You know, you look at his run, he says, here it comes as soon as the Gravemind load happens. All right, here it comes. Pray for me. Gravemind was okay with five deaths, but he followed it up with two more really good splits. Through it all, Zoo wound up being ahead going into Great Journey, a level where he had even more time to save. Seeing how far ahead he was of the record actually entering it and how much time he had to play with, all I'm thinking in my head right here is, you've done this a million times before, just hold it down. You have time to lose, do not full tilt if Great Journey trolls you. All you need to do is hang on and you got this. Uh, it wasn't the best, it wasn't the cleanest, but it was good enough to pull out the record. Did I do it? Oh my god, let's go. <laughs> Barely a 121 as well. <laughs> More so than anything, finally getting the record, I was just relieved. He had finally broken through the barrier. He had finally taken his first record, and the sky's the limit at this point, you know? All he has to do now is go wherever he wants to. Zoo had the record, but he admitted in the description that he didn't expect to hang on to it for long. Rokats was still around, and Cryphon and Sinister weren't far behind. So, despite having accomplished his goal, he continued to do runs. And to shake things up a bit, he decided to start going for a new, incredibly risky strategy in regret. The Gondola Launch. You start by getting on the first gondola at the start of Regret. While on it, you can deload the Phantom by repeatedly meleeing. This delays the checkpoint, which in turn deletes the Phantom when it reaches the middle platform. As a byproduct of all this, a timer starts on the second gondola, and when it runs out, it'll travel back to the start. Once you get to the middle platform, you push the button and finish killing the enemies. This acts as a trigger to send the second gondola forward. So the second gondola now has two commands, one to send it back and one to send it forward. And if these commands overlap within a roughly one second window, the game doesn't know what to do. So it deloads the gondola entirely. And the strange result of this, if you're standing on the gondola, you'll get launched through the air. Nails figured out how to do this back in 2018, but for years it was considered too risky to do in legendary runs. You save a good 30 to 40 seconds by not having to wait to do the sword fly, 
but missing it costs nearly two minutes. Risky as it was, Zood decided it was time to try implementing it in his runs. It would undoubtedly cause more runs to die at regret, but the 40 second time save was too good to pass up. It could lead to some crazy paces. Well, on September 26th, Zoo got on a run with the gondola launch. It pushed him over a minute ahead of the world record. This was a fantastic opportunity. But it got even more serious when he got a gold split on Gravemind, the fastest he had ever done it in a run. With just three levels to go, he was two minutes ahead of the record. This was a chance for a sub-120, a time that seemed unthinkable to Zoo just weeks ago. All he needed was to get through three more levels. He just had to close it out. And well, here's how it went. In High Charity, he tried to lure the Flood over so he could do High Charity Skip, but failed and had to revert. He succeeded on the second try, but accidentally pushed him off the ledge. These time losses hurt, yet he still retained a minute lead. But Great Journey was even worse. He died three times, including twice while driving the Spectre. He still finished the run off as a world record, but it was nowhere near what it could have been. This was starting to become a habit for Zoo. He was getting crazy paces late into runs, and things went wrong in the final couple levels to derail it. But this run did make one thing clear. Sub-120 was now the ultimate goal for Halo 2. Zoo had been on pace for it. Now, he just needed a clean ending. Well, a few weeks later, he got on a run that fell behind in the middle levels. He had to revert to the last checkpoint five times in regret, despite getting the gondola launch. He also had a slower ending to Sacred Icon, and couldn't match the gold split in Gravemind of his last run. Zoo was running against balanced splits that he had made, but in reality, he was about 45 seconds behind the record going into High Charity. But he knew he could save that time in the final two levels. And despite dying once in High Charity, he managed to save over a minute in the end to get the record. The final time was 1.20.56. A solid record, but now it had the opposite problem. A weak middle game with a really strong ending. In order to get the sub-120, the run had to be great from start to finish. But Zoo wasn't discouraged. He pressed onward, more determined than ever to get the sub-120. And the very next day after this 120.56, this happened. I was feeling very good about it from the very start because I got my Cairo was a 440, and that was I individual level record for Cairo. So right off the bat, I was like motivated to keep it going. Got a decent regret this time. Got the time save or a lot of the time save I need for that mission. When he build up this big time pool into Grave Mind, you're kind of like you don't want to set your expectations too high. But then he got a really good Grave Mind. I think it was like a 905. That's just insane. So he's suddenly on this incredibly sick pace. And you're just hoping that it survives. At that point, I was getting nervous again. I was letting the nerves starting to, starting to get to me. 12 levels into the run, Zoo had amassed a 1 minute and 23 second lead. Just Great Journey stood between him and a 119. But there was still so much that could go wrong. At this point, when he entered Great Journey that far ahead, I was super nervous for him. He can either get his goal, he can be happy, or it's going to be the most heartbreaking run of his life. Having done some of those runs myself, I know it's not over until the final cutscene plays on Great Journey. And unfortunately, that's kind of how this run played out. Your heart sinks, and it's just tragic to watch. Despite the deaths, 
The run still finished as a world record. Zhu had missed the sub 120 by just 14 seconds. Like, can I just get it already? Can I stop choking the last mission and just clutch it out? The good news was that Zhu now had 50 seconds to save in the final level. So once again, if he could just get there on a reasonable pace, he could save a bunch of time and get the record. Like having a, a 58-25 split out of QZ, Quarantine Zone, like people consider like a sub one hour out of QZ to be very good. I just, I remember having like a 58-25, like this is, this runs pretty nuts right now. This one could be it, it could be the one. As long as he can stay close to his PB, he knows he's got a ton of time to save a great journey, almost a minute in fact. And this run was shaping up just for that. I was, only, I was 10 seconds behind going into Great Journey, but I had a minute of time save. There's so much time to save. This run should definitely be it. On top of that, I was like, I was streaming, so I was like excited to get the sub-120 in front of everyone watching. In the final boss, there's some reinforcement waves that happen when you're killing the final boss based on when he gets to a certain th certain health threshold. Now, normally, they don't really matter and you can get the final boss dead with the Johnson glitch. So once you kill the final boss, there is about 10 seconds before the level actually ends. And during that time, all the enemies and all your teammates, like they're still active, they're still fighting out there. And if you're caught in the crossfire, you can easily die and just revert back to the very start of the fight. So by the time I finally killed him, there was a brute right behind me. He punches me. I start freaking out. Like I. I didn't know what to do, I didn't know how to save it, so I kind of just did a random input and then I I lost it there. Bro, no way! No way! Yeah, I don't, there's so many emotions, like I was angry, annoyed, I was embarrassed because this just happened on stream. This run was it, Tartarus was dead, all I had to do was wait 10 seconds and then the run was finished. It's heartbreaking to watch that happen especially on a run so fast it took a lot of me trying to like really reassure him and try to convince him like hey you've done this once you can do it again you're in a league of your own you are so far ahead of everyone else and the paces you're getting are so consistently fast that this is going to come with time zoo's motivation hadn't dried up he knew the sub 120 was within reach he kept pushing onward through the month of november and on november 7th he'd have his next good chance. It started off really good, like even though it started off with some time loss, a 448 Cairo was still like insane. The missions after that went pretty, pretty standard. So I was, uh, I ended up being ahead by quite a bit. And then Regret came, Regret, everything went my way basically. Then I finished QZ, ended up getting a QZ. A 57-53 split is I remember also being hyped for that. Like, that's insanely fast for a Halo 2 Legendary. When I saw those splits, a run that was this fast and still gaining with time to save on Great Journey, I was blown away. This was shaping up to be one of the best Halo 2 speedruns of all time. I do High Charity Skip. I, I remember specifically, I practiced High Charity Skip a ton before this run, so I ended up getting a gold split. Everything was aligning. Zoo had only died seven times, none of which were particularly costly. It all amounted to a 24 second lead going into Great Journey, where he could save another huge chunk of time. The pressure was on. My mindset with this run, like, as if I'm 
ahead at all going into Great Journey, then like I have this in the bag. I should have this in the bag. When he got to Great Journey, I am without a doubt certain that he was incredibly nervous. As I progressed, everything seemed to go my way completely. Okay, so the end fight, these Johnsons, the Johnsons were like in some sort of conga line. The Johnson behind the first one wouldn't shoot at Tartarus because it would mean, you know, he was shooting his own teammate. So he just didn't shoot at all. <laughs> so that kind of prolonged the fight. Like it was taking a while for Tartarus to die. So that gave the brute reinforcements, giving the brute reinforcements time to get on the platform and kill me. But uh, that didn't happen. It's just, it's so good. Like, there's, you know, mistakes here and there, but Halo 2 Legendary, you don't get a run that's going to be perfect. This had so few deaths, so few mistakes, so little trolls by RNG, that the time is just incredible. I felt... This was, like, one of the only times where I felt happy with the PB, you know? Like, I felt satisfied. Like, this is actually a good run. So I was, I was happy, you know, like... Happy for the first time with a BB with a run. It was it was such a good run. I finally considered a run to be good. To this day, Zoo's 119 remains on top of the leaderboard. There's been a recent push to break the record, thanks to a $3,000 bounty placed by Eki. In the first few months of 2023, Kryphon, Sinister, and Nails have all improved their times but Zoo's world record still stands above them. Five years ago, world record runs used to not be saved. The game was an afterthought compared to Halo 2 Classic. Now, Halo 2 Anniversary has a thriving community, with a world record that reflects that. And as solid as it is, there's no doubt that competition will drive it far lower in the years to come. This has been the history of Halo 2 World Records. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe if you enjoyed, since that really helps me out. Thank you.